Clostridium difficile. It is a gram-positive rod. It is an anaerobic bacterium. Anaerobic means that it can live in the absence or in less oxygen. It is a part of the normal GI flora of some human beings, not all the human beings, right? It is responsible for causing two major diseases. One is antibiotic-associated pseudomembranous colitis. It is associated with antibiotic, specifically clindamycin. There are certain other antibiotics like the third generation cephalosporins. We are going to talk about all of them in detail in today's video. The second disease it causes is the diarrhea, that is the nosocomial diarrhea. It means that it is acquired from the hospital when a patient or a person has a recent stay in hospital, right? In this picture, you can see the Clostridium difficile. It is rod-shaped. It has got these long hair-like structures. This is flagella. It is responsible for producing the toxin, the exotoxins. It produces two types of exotoxins. The first one is enterotoxin A and the second one is cytotoxin B. It is responsible for producing spores in the conditions where it feels like it's not suitable for me to survive and spores then germinate back into bacterium when they find the conditions around them or the environment is favorable to their growth. This bacterium belongs to the family of Clostridia. Assalamu alaikum everybody. Today we'll be talking about Clostridia difficile in detail. If you've missed my recent videos on Clostridia, be sure to check them out. The link to their videos are in the description. But before getting into the video, I'd like to tell you guys that these videos are meant for educational purposes. Things and treatments may change with time. If I get wrong or miss anything, your input is always welcomed in the comment section. Grab a pen and a notepad and let's get started. Clostridia. It has got forming four species. I've discussed the top three and today we'll be talking about the fourth one. What are these? Let's know their names. The first one is Clostridium perfringens, the second one is Clostridium tetani, the third one is Clostridium botulinum and the last one, the topic of today's video, is Clostridium difficile. But before talking about Clostridium difficile in detail, we should know how the bacteria are classified. Bacteria are classified into spirochetes and in acid fast. Um, on the basis of acid fast stain, right? And there's also an exception that is mycoplasma bacterium. And bacteria are also classified on the basis of gram staining into gram negative and gram positive. We are not concerned here with gram negative because Clostridium difficile is gram positive. Let's talk about that. Gram positive are further classified into cocci and rods. Rods are further subdivided into non-spore forming, we're not talking about them, we're talking about spore forming which are further classified into aerobic, for example bacillus, and anaerobic, for example clostridium. For your information, the non-spore forming rods are further classified into filamentous and non-filamentous. Both the aerobic and anaerobic rods are further subdivided into motile and non-motile. The motile aerobic rod is bacillus cereus and the non-motile aerobic rod is bacillus anthracis. The non-motile anaerobic rod is clostridium per fringens and the motile anaerobic rod is Clostridium tetani, botulinum and Clostridium difficile, the topic of today's video. Lecture outline. We are done with the introduction and classification. Now we'll be looking at morphology, habitat in transmission, risk factors, pathogenesis and clinical findings, lab diagnosis, treatment, prevention and at the end, as usual, we'll review the lecture. Morphology. This bacterium is rod shaped. As you can see in this picture, it is kind of elongated, just like that, bit of rectangular in shape, size. It varies in length from 3 to 5 micrometers and in width it is 0.5 micrometer. It is purple or blue in color. The reason behind is it is gram positive. It has got a thick peptidoglycan layer in its cell wall that retains the dye. As you can see in this picture, this is a microscopic picture, it is showing the purple colored bacterium structure. As I told you, it has got a thick peptidoglycan layer that helps in retaining the dye that makes it gram positive. It is encapsulated, it is flagellated that makes it motile. It is poor forming in the environment where it feels like it's not suitable for me. It produces toxins like the exotoxins A and B. The first one is enterotoxin A as its name shows that it will be present in the intestine like the enterocytes or the cells of the intestine and its name starts with entero, right? And the second one is cytotoxin B. This is how the Clostridium difficile looks like under the microscope habitat. Hosts. Human beings are the hosts. The organism, the Clostridium difficile, colonizes the large intestine 
mean the gut, of approximately 3% of the general population and up to 30% of hospitalized patients. The thing to memorize here is that most people are not colonized with this organism, which explains why people who take antibiotics do not get pseudomembranous colitis. A major source that play a huge role in the transfer of the pseudomembranous colitis is hospitals. Transmission. Clostridium difficile is transmitted by fecal-oral route or either the spores or the bacterial organism itself can be transmitted. And many of the cases are observed in hospitalized patients, but there can be some community-acquired cases. And the hands of hospital personnel are important intermediaries that also play a major role in the transfer of infection. Risk factors. Recent antibiotic use may be in the past three months. Clindamycin is the first antibiotic that plays a major role in causing the infections caused by Clostridium difficile like pseudomembranous colitis. Other antibiotics like third generation cephalosporins, ampicillin, fluoroquinolones also play a major role in causing the pseudomembranous colitis by C. difficile. Cancer chemotherapy and proton pump inhibitors also play a major role in causing pseudomembranous colitis. Recent hospital stay may be of 48 hours or more than that and increasing age is also a risk factor. Immunosuppression and certain gastrointestinal anomalies also play a major role. Pathogenesis. Clostridium difficile is present in our intestine in three conditions. Number one, if it is a part of the normal flora. Number two, if it is present in a person as a carrier, like if a person has recovered from a disease or if a person is suffering from asymptomatic infection. And the third one, a patient suffering from the infection has that one in his or her intestine. What happens when C. diff is present in the intestine of any person? It has got certain surface layer proteins that help in binding it to the enterocytes. As you can see in this picture, these bacteria are trying to bind to the brush border of the enterocytes in this intestine in order to cause the infection. And you know, might be asking a question if it's a part of the normal flora, how this is going to cause the infection. If it is present normally in human body, it's present in certain number that does not cause infection. If its number increases more than that normal number, so here the thing comes is that if C. diff multiplies and increases its number and grows, it will then cause infection. And how will it do so? It will produce certain toxins like enterotoxin A and cytotoxin B. And then these toxins will cause what? They will damage the tissue. How these two toxins cause the damage. Let's talk about that. These two toxins are the virulence factors. The first one is enterotoxin. Prior to explaining that, let me tell you that this is the normal intestine and this is its brush border with its enterocytes, right? And this is the intestine with the C. diff, the Clostridium difficile, it is releasing certain surface layer proteins that are helping it to adhere. When it adheres there, it multiplies and grows and produces toxins. The first one is enterotoxin. The enterotoxin A does what? It binds to the intestinal brush border. Here, it facilitates intracellular transport of both toxins A and B. It inactivates the Rho family protein, thereby damaging the epithelial junctions. When the epithelial junctions are damaged, it will lead to fluid leakage that will cause the diarrhea. You might be thinking how the antibiotic is causing such a big damage. Antibiotics actually does what? They disturb the normal flora. They damage the normal human flora that leads to the seed of growth. And they can also suppress drug sensitive members of the normal flora of colon. And then it allows the seed of to multiply and produce large amounts of the enterotoxin a and cytotoxin B. Both the exotoxin A and B are glucosyl transferases, i.e. enzymes that glucosylate means to add glucose to a G protein. That's called rho GTPase. The second one, cytotoxin B. It depolymerizes the actin cytoskeleton and it releases endosomal contents that have a direct cytotoxic effect. And the depolymerization of actin results in the loss of cytoskeletal integrity. It causes apoptosis and death of enterocytes. 
The exotoxin B, it plays a leading role in producing the signs and symptoms of the human disease. For its memorization, I've got a really cool thing. For intero, it has got intero in it. That means intestine or related to intestine and the intestinal cells are the enterocytes. So you can memorize it by like enterotoxin A binds to intestinal brush border means on the enterocytes and it facilitates intra. Like intra is similar in sound to intestinal. So from that you can grab the concept. And for cytotoxin B, the cytotoxin B depolymerizes the actin cytotoxin in both are similar right and the third thing is it releases endosomal contents that have a direct cytotoxic effect clinical findings clostridium difficile causes it is usually termed as post antibiotic diarrhea because it's caused by after a antibiotic therapy usually clindamycin it can be acute right and the diarrhea is odorous, means foul smelling, it can be watery. The diarrhea is usually not bloody and neutrophils are found in the stool of the patient. Fever and abdominal pain often occurs and there is a yellow whitish plaque on the colonic mucosa and this organism rarely enters the bloodstream. The Clostridium difficile rarely enters the bloodstream and rarely causes metastatic infection. There can be nausea and anorexia. There can be malaise. And for pseudomembranous colitis, it increases the risk of ileus or toxic megacolon. There will be pseudomembranous plaques on colonic mucosa, which are the fibrin exudates, this one. It can progress to fulminant colitis, which is a really severe form. In that condition, there might be diarrhea, there will be low quadrant or diffuse abdominal pain, there will be abdominal distension, fever, hypovolemia cause the junctions in the epithelial cells are not good enough right now and there is diarrhea that will lead to volemia and that junctions are leading to leakage of fluid. There will be lactic acidosis, there will be hypoalbuminemia, there will be high creatinine and increased leukocytosis. There are are certain stages in the severity of C. diff infection. The first one is mild. That, if not treated, can lead to moderate. If that one is not treated, it will lead to the severe one. In mild, there is only diarrhea. In moderate, there is diarrhea accompanied by other signs and symptoms, but there are no severe complications. In severe, there are severe complications along with diarrhea and other signs and symptoms. And these are hypoalbuminemia, leukocytosis, high creatinine, fever, abdominal tenderness. If the C. diff infection, pseudomembranous colitis or the diarrhea is not treated, it will cause invasive disease that will lead to sepsis and a sarcoma. That's a condition where there's edema in different parts of the body. There will be bowel perforations, peritonitis, and toxic megacolon. Lab diagnosis. We'll need a sample of stool that can be liquid or semi-solid. We'll also need a sample of blood. We'll need a sample of stool because we want to know about the neutrophils presence in it. We want to know about the blood presence in it. Then we'll go for microscopy and gram staining. On gram staining, it was revealed that this bacterium is gram positive because of purple color. And under microscopy, this bacterium appeared to be rod shaped. It varies in length from 3 to 5 micrometers and in width to 0.5 micrometers. It's purple or blue in color. This is how C. diff looks like under the microscope rod shaped, purple color. This organism is usually not cultured, but whenever cultured, it's cultured anaerobically and it has a rapid growth on culture as you can see there these yellow spots and lines refer to the colonies of C. diff we'll go for vitals from there we'll get to know about fever if the temperature is high or low we'll get to know about hypovolemia if the blood pressure of the patient is low we'll also go for blood work like cbc electrolytes creatinine albumin lactic We'll find out their concentrations. We'll, in CBC, look for leukocytosis, right? We can also go for visualization of pseudomembrane via colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy. There are two types of tests used to make the lab diagnosis perfect. One that detects the exotoxin itself and the other that detects the genes that encode the exotoxin.
toxin. To detect the exotoxin itself, an ELISA test, the enzyme immunosorbent, employing antibody to exotoxin is used. To detect the genes that encode the exotoxin, a PCR assay is used to determine the presence of the toxin gene DNA can also go for the city of abdomen or pelvis. Treatment. First of all, what we are going to do, we'll remove the causative antibiotic. Let's say if it's clindamycin, just stop its use. Then we'll look for the first episode. If the patient has got the first episode, then we'll go for vancomycin or fidaxomycin. And both of them will be oral. And we'll also go for metronidazole. That will be oral. And it is proved very effective in the first episode. For its memorization, I've got a really cool mnemonic. That is very first episode. V is for vancomycin. F is for fidaxomycin. And F and E both are for first episode. Then we've got recurrent. Because the recurrent infections of C. diff are really common after the first or second episodes. For recurrent episode, we'll go for fidaxomycin. If it doesn't treat, then we'll go for Refaximin. And then we can also go for Bezlotoxumab. For that, I've also got a really cool mnemonic, and that is future recurrences. F is for Fidaxomycin, and R is for Refaximin. And both are for future recurrences too. Because there is diarrhea, we'll also need fluid resuscitation. And in case of severe cases, we can go for surgical removal of colon. Fecal microbiota transplantation is another therapeutic approach. It involves administering bowel flora of a normal individual either by enema or by a nasoduodenal tube to the patient with pseudomembranous colitis. This approach has proved to be really effective but due to cer certain aesthetic consideration its acceptance is limited and it's not practiced widely. Prevention. There is no preventive vaccine. In hospitals, strict infection control procedures should be followed, like hand washing. And probiotics such as yeast, Saccharomyces, it may be useful to prevent pseudomembranous colitis. All right, guys, let's review everything in this short table. The organism we discussed today is Clostridium difficile. It is responsible for causing gastrointestinal illnesses like antibiotic-associated pseudomembranous colitis or nosocomial diarrhea. It is transmitted via fecal-oral route. Hosts are humans, and its major source is hospital. It is diagnosed via gram-staining, microscopy, rarely cultured, colonoscopy, blood work, ELISA, and PCR. It is treated with metronidazole, vancomycin, fidaxomycin, rifaximin, bezlotoxumab. Fluid replacement is necessary in case of diarrhea and hypovolemia, surgical removal of colon in severe cases, fecal microbiota transplantation from a normal individual to the infected one. And that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. You've learned something. If you've got any suggestions, feel free to leave them below in the comment section. And also, if you want to connect with me on my socials, I've got my Instagram and Twitter. And I'll catch you in the next video. Till then, assalamu alaikum.